today we'll be studying grade eight chapter number uh, two history that is from trade to territory the company establishes bar you know what this chapter is very very important for you know because this tells uh, this explains the beginning of the british rule in india actually the britishers came to india for just trading purposes and acquired the whole territory how the hell does this happen yeah this would be the question that would be striked up in your mind so today will be you know covering up the topic the policies introduced by the britishers and you know every single thing of this chapter it's a very nice interesting chapter so stay tuned with me you'll find it interesting too all right so this chapter begins with the story of the Aurangzeb. So Aurangzeb was the last powerful Mughal rulers. He established a control over a large territory that now we say as India. Right? Yeah. When Aurangzeb died, you know, uh, when Aurangzeb died, he died in 1707. He was the ruler of the country. He was the most, he was, the, you know, the, the, the most powerful ruler of the country. The most powerful. Because after him, the rulers which came, they all were very weak. They all were very weak. All right. So, this was the thing. So, when he died, you know, when Aurangzeb died, then many people, the many small people, established their own kingdoms. They established their own kingdoms, and uh, as they starting established their own kingdoms, you know Delhi could no longer function as an effective center. They all wanted their own. They wanted to rule their own kingdoms. You know. They wanted to, to be known as rulers. They wanted to rule the uh, their their areas. So they established some small regional kingdoms. Now, as so many regional kingdoms had emerged, Delhi could no longer function as an effective center. All right. East India Company comes east in sixteen zero zero. This is you know what the beginning of the British rule in India beginning very important please look over here very carefully very important so in 1600 eic acquired so what happened was the east india company um, let me just change the color of the pen first of all so that i can draw over here at the picture and explain you so east india company basically acquired a charter What's a charter? It's a written grant permission from whom? The Queen Elizabeth I. All right. So they acquired a charter from her. And basically this charter said that no other trading companies could, uh, you know, uh, could rule in the country where you are trading. Like, for example, the EIC came to India for trading. Okay. So, for example, they came India for trading. So, as they came to India for trading, then what would happen? You tell. It was that when they'll come to India, you know, no other company from England could compete with them. If they're trading in India, no other company could trade in India except them. Wasn't it strange? Yes, it was. All right. But, you know what, this law wasn't that successful. This law wasn't successful. Because till the time East India Company reached at the coasts of India. When they reached at the coasts of India, they found that the Portuguese, the Dutch, these people were already at the scene. So, you know, it created a... 
uh, what do I say that? A feeling of competition among these people. Now they said that we will only do it. Okay, so such kinds of thing were happening, you know, fights, the wars between these people that we only want India. And by the way, have you ever wondered why these all people wanted only India? Actually, East India Company was a company which was finding countries, any country it would work for them, where they could buy goods at cheap prices and sell them further to Europe at higher prices to earn profits. So that is why they found, uh, they used to, you know, to, what do you say, venture across oceans looking for new lands. All right. So this was the thing, but... So actually they found India as such a country and so they started beginning up their rule. Here, if you look, where they could buy cheap goods, right, and carry them back to Europe and sell them to at higher prices. Company did not have fear competition with other trading companies, the mercantile. What was mercantile? By the way, mercantile is a trading company which buys the goods at cheap prices and sell them further at a higher price. All right, so this was what your mercantile. Is this much clear? Because uh, this is the beginning of, you know, the, the thing. Why did British want to only, you know, rule India and that all thing? So, now, however, the Royal Charter, however, could not prevent other European companies from entering the Eastern markets. I said, right? By the time the first English ships sailed down to the west coast of Africa, round Cape of Good Hope and crossed the Indian Ocean, the Portuguese had already established their presence in the western coast of India and had the base in Goa. How strange, right? Then, in fact, Vasco da Gama, oh my god, where did my stuff go? Well, I don't know where. Well, so let me tell you what the thing was that. As I told you, the Royal Charter, which he acquired, who acquired? East India Company. Why did they acquire this charter? In order to, in order for ruling, that only they will rule. Actually, you know, India was very famous for its silk production, for its textiles, you know, spices, merchandise muslin muslin so for all these things india was very famous and all these people wanted to uh, sorry wanted to you know come to india for their what do i say that uh, for their trading purposes right as i now said you that before east india company many portuguese dutch these all people had arrived to the scene and in this picture, you can see there is a fight type thing going on. <clears throat> so basically, they used to sank each other's ship, block the routes. They wanted to occupy the markets. They wanted to occupy the markets which were in India. They wanted all the products in India. So they used to fight with the companies, with the other trading companies, with the royal competitors. Yeah, so this was the thing which was happening, the, the wars, right? Now, what was the problem? The problem was that all the companies were interested in buying the same thing. Very, very important. This was the problem that all the country, I mean, all the companies were interested in buying the same thing. What do I mention to... I mean, like, what do I mean by same things over here? It means silk. Oh, my God, I'm not able to write well. Okay, silk. Textiles. Cardamom. You know, spices and many things. India was famous for spices. So, textiles and these all things. Okay. India had a big market in Europe. See, the fine qualities 
hundred of cotton and silk produced in India had big markets in Europe. Okay, so the silk and the cotton that was produced in India was in such a great demand in Europe. You won't believe this is what he is saying, right? Now there was a competition among them. Now, pepper, cloves, cardamom, and cinnamon, two were in great demand, right? Amongst the European companies, this inevitably pushed up the prices and reduced the profits that could be earned. It's very obvious. Now, if you are buying anything, you know, if I am, if I have a anything, if I have. A pencil with me, and uh, I have thousands of people running for this pencil. They're saying that I'll buy, I'll buy, I'll buy, I'll buy. So, what would happen is that I will inevitably increase the prices of this pencil. I will obviously increase the prices of this thing. Why to earn the profits? Right. So now, in order to earn these profits, what happened was this: the prices were in increased. I mean, right? As now these all prices are increased, the companies got worried. Right. Now the urge to secure the markets thus led the battles between them. What led to the battles? The urge to secure these markets. So now, what did now this increase the prices, right? And this reduced the profits for them. The only way trading companies could flourish was by eliminating the rival competitors. Now, who the hell are these rival competitors? These um, Portuguese, Dutch. You know these people. the other european companies basically all right the urge to secure markets led to fierce battles through 17 and 18 centuries they regularly sank each other's ship blocked the routes and even prevented the rival ships from moving right trade was carried on with arms and fortification it's very important so basically this is the beginning of the british rule in india okay so it was a uh, it was a beginning of the british rule in india right we can say that it is can't we yes we can say because you know when they reached at the coast of india for trading they for i mean they saw so many difficulties in trading right Yeah, I see. Begins its trade in Bengal. Very, very important. Please look over here. Bengal over there, Nasi. Bengal was not the Bengal that you have presently. It was composed of the Orissa, the Assam, the Bihar, and you know many other states. Yeah, it was not alone. it composed bangladesh everything man everything uh at bengal we had some rulers that um, we had some important rulers at bengal like please remember whenever i say the name of bengal no remember at least their names i say sirajatullah the main yes the sirajatullah ali wardi khan well these are the two important people if i talk about trading in bengal right right now i'm talking about these rulers before talking about these rulers let's talk about you know uh, what let's talk about when they reached so when they reached bengal what did they do at first it was not like that that, that they reached bengal and they got a shake hands with sirajatullah ali wardi khan no 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 let's see what happened when they began their trade in bengal
all right so the first english factory that was set see i saw i mean i, I told you right so when they began their trade in bengal they had set up a factory on the banks of river hooghly in 1651 This was the base from where the companies, traders, known as uh, at that time factors, operated. The factory had a warehouse. What do we mean by warehouse? Warehouse is a place or a factory for storage of your goods, right? So if I do any, you know. if i do a trading business type things you know trading things then i'll have a warehouse to store my things right yeah okay now where goods for export were stored all right this is what we actually mean by the warehouses all right now the company no as trade expanded the company persuaded merchants and traders to come and settle near the factory by 1696 it began building fort around means fortification started right around the settlement two years later it bribed mughal officials into giving the zamindari rights over the three villages one of this was the calicutta that's now calcutta it's persuaded by mughal aurangzeb to issue granting farman now this is very very important guys listen carefully i'm telling you now uh aurangzeb he granted a farman what did he grant a farman what's a farman it's order type thing you know order a permission you can say a permission type thing he granted the permission to whom east india company for what did he grant the permission for that now the see if any trader comes in a country for trading no he has to pay some taxes usko kuch taxes pay karne padte the right the person who comes in india for trading has to pay some taxes right now you know these were very important for the rulers yeah it was a good source of income for them a good source of income yeah it was a good source of income for them but aurangzeb a stupid person what did he do you know what he said that let's make a deal let's make a deal that i will yes i will give you a farman granting you the right to trade duty free means the east india company that came you know they came for the trading purpose right and as according to the rule any company which comes to for trading has to pay the taxes but aurangzeb said that you are free of paying taxes means you do not have to pay taxes oh my god it was a golden opportunity for them right wasn't it a stupid decision by the way Yes, it was. He's making laws, right? It gave them a golden opportunity for the for the Britishers, you know. Company tried continuously to press for more concessions and manipulate the existing privileges. Aurangzeb's farman, for instance, had granted only the company's right to trade duty free, but if a but of uh, but the officials of the company who were carrying on private trade. were expected to pay the duty this they refused to pay causing an enormous loss of revenue for bengal now see uh, as we have started that aurangzeb aurangzeb said that ic the company 
does not have to pay any taxes company ko koi taxes nahi dene padenge aap aaram se india ke andar trade kar sakte ho right you can trade in india with danis okay but these officials these officials started misusing their right they started misusing their rights yeah this cause an enormous loss of revenue in bengal yeah it now i'll i'll write some points over here this led to uh great this led to a great loss of what uh, income and source of income led to a great loss of income for sirajuddulla this caused a fire in him he got he got super angry he got so angry that he said that who sirajuddulla who was sirajuddulla ruler of bengal at that time he said that you have to pay taxes aapko tax pay karne padenge you are misusing the rights to tum ab tax pay karo pay the taxes please stop fortification stop fortification and when the eic did not follow these two orders sirajuddulla attacked attacked where the factory of the eic that was at kasim bazar yeah we just had uh, discussed about the factory right he attacked there wasn't it a good idea right now how did these trades led to battles through early 18th century the conflict between the death sorry between the company and the nawabs of bengal intensified after the death of foreign state bengal nawabs asserted their power and autonomy as a regional power were doing at that time murshid quli khan was followed by ali wardi khan and then the sirajuddulla was the nawab of bengal each one is each one of them was a strong ruler they refused they refused the company's right to trade they denied it any right to mint coin stopped it from extending its fortification accusing the company to decide the claimed company was depriving the bengal government of huge amounts of revenue and undermining the authority of the nawab it was refusing to pay taxes writing disrespectful letters and trying to humiliate the nawab and his officials um now i'm going to show you a video or a documentary um, some something based on it only that i'll show you right now mm, because mm, okay i've not created on this thing uh, yeah i have on battle of plus i think so yeah yes i f- i don't know where in my links go because i had created l- some links for you guys uh yeah i'll show you for the battle of the pilase company declared that the answers yeah so basically what was happening mm. So now what was happening? Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, here comes the battle. Of the the battle. battle. Yeah, I'll just show you just a minute. Let me explain. So what happened was that when you know uh, when this Ali Wardi Khan died, then Sir Raju Dulla became the Nawab of Bengal. Now when he became the Nawab of Bengal, he was facing a lot of economic crisis. What happened was that actually, let me show you. Yeah, here. Um, yes, 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 yes. So basically, when this person, when Sir Raja Dulla was made the Nawab, what 
as we know the company was misusing their right to trade right they were misusing their rights right then what happened actually was he said that pay taxes usne kaha ki taxes ab tum pay karo tumne bahut misuse kari rights ko right then he said that stop fortification and when he attacked where did he attack when he attacked the Kasim Bazaar, Robert Clive killed Sirajuddullah in the Battle of the Plassey. How did he kill? With the help of Mir Jafar. Now, who the hell is Mir Jafar? Mir Jafar was a person. He was a person in Sirajuddullah's, you know, kingdom only. He was a kind of sepoy, you can say, something like that, right? So, Mir Jafar, what did he say that? Now, he was bribed. The Robert Clive promised him to make him the Nawab when Sirajudullah would be killed. Matlab, basically, let me explain you in Hindi. Hua kya tha, basically, Mir Jafar, jo tha, usko Britishers ne bribe kara tha. किस लिए ब्राइब करा था उन ब्रिटिशर्स ने कहा था कि हम तुमको नवाब बना देंगे कहाँ का बंगाल का अगर तुम यूल हेल्प पास टू किल सराजुल्ला अगर तुमने सराजुल्ला को मारने में हमारी मदद कर दी देन वी विल मेक यू दी नवाब ऑफ बंगाल ना वो इन अ ग्रीडीनेस अब वो क्योंकि बिकेज ही बिकेम ग्रीडी यू नो ही सैड या फिर श्योर आई एम गॉन किल दिस पर्सन and uh, yep sure you're gonna win okay so this was so this person no sirajullah was killed right see he led an army here he led an army against sirajullah okay one main reason for defeat of nawab was that the forces were led by mir jafar one of sirajuddullah's commanders never for the battle he has to man support by promising right ab ye battle of plassey hi tha kya tha battle of plassey jab sirajuddullah ko haraya gaya tha when sirajuddullah was defeated when was sirajuddullah defeated anyone yes sirajuddullah was defeated in um, 1757 by robert clive and why was he defeated he was defeated by mir jafar because he was angry because he was against the british because they were misusing their rights right now let me show you the yes oh. here it is the classic you will be able to list the factors that led to the battle of plassey List the reasons for the defeat of Siraj ud Dola in the Battle of Plassey. The East India Company felt that the large fee demanded by the Nawabs and the local rulers to carry on trade was unfair. They also felt that the enlargement of settlements, buying of villages, and building of forts, which were banned by the Nawab, were necessary for the expansion of their trade. What the company wanted was a puppet ruler who would act in their favor. So they tried to replace the then Nawab of Bengal, Siraj ud Dawla, with one of his rivals. This angered Siraj ud Dawla, and he ordered the company to stop interfering in his governance affairs. He also ordered the company to stop fortifying their settlements and pay their taxes. When the company failed to accede to his demands, The Nawab marched with thirty thousand of his men and took control of Qasim Bazar and Calcutta Fort. He cut off all supplies and support to the company's ships. To aid the company, armed forces were sent from Madras under the leadership of Robert Clive. The company's naval fleet was also sent. Robert Clive defeated Nawab Siraj ud Dawla at a place called Palashi in 1757 in the famous Battle of Plassey. 
The main reason for Siraj ud Dawla's defeat was Mir Jafar, one of his commanders who turned traitor and never fought the battle. Robert Clive had promised Mir Jafar that he would be made Nawab after Siraj ud Dawla for his services. The Battle of Plassey was the company's first victory on Indian soil. We have learned that the East India Company tried to replace Nawab Siraj ud Dawla with a puppet ruler. Siraj ud Dawla took control of Qasim Bazar and Calcutta Fort. Armed forces under the leadership of Robert Clive were sent along with a naval fleet to fight Siraj ud Dawla. Mir Jafar, one of Nawab Siraj ud Dawla's commanders, turned traitor and never fought the battle. Robert Clive defeated Nawab Siraj ud Dawla in 1757 in the famous Battle of Plassey. Alright, so this is the video. Okay, I'm sorry for... Yeah, let's come uh, forward. I hope the Battle of the Place was clear. Now, when Battle of Place was, uh, you know, occurred, mm, we know why did Battle of Place occur. Now we know the uh, the main reason. Why was Battle of Plassey famous? It was because it was the first victory of British in India. Because it was the first major victory of British company in India. Britishers became uh, the, the East India Company, which just came for trading in India, won a battle. It was the first victory of Britishers in India. Isn't it? I mean, isn't it disgusting? Well, okay. Yeah, so what happened after the Battle of the Plassey? A kind of a dual system was established. Now, you could ask what is, sorry, what is dual system, right? Dual system meant that they would be just pretending that the powers are in the hands of the Nawabs. But the powers actually led in the hands of the British company, right? And only the stupid responsibilities led in the Nawabs. Right, so this was the dual system. Right, what was the dual system? Was that the East India Company was just pretending for giving the rights to Nawabs, but the rights, the actual, the financial rights were in hands of the Britishers. Right? Now, what could the company do? When Mir Jafar protested, the company deposed him. A Mir Jafar ko bhi laga when the company asked them high revenue sources. Mir Jafar also felt that the company was wrong. When Mir Jafar protested, he dethroned them and installed Mir Kasim. Now, when Mir Kasim also repel, I mean, when Mir Kasim also protested a battle of bugs was in the action all right i'll discuss about that so when mir kasim complained in turn he was defeated in the battle of the bugs right driven out of bengal mir jafar was reinstalled so yeah so what were the these were kind of a puppet ruler puppet rulers because they were working on the say of the company right they were they were not independent they were dependent on the company for their needs right now nawab had to pay five lakh every month but the company wanted more finance to its wars and met demands of trade its other expenses it wanted more territories and more revenue by the time Mir Jafar died in 1765, the mood of the company had changed. Having failed to work with puppet Nawabs, they declared that we must indeed to become Nawabs ourselves. Now, when they were, you know, unhappy with these stupid puppet people, the puppet Nawabs like Mir Jafar and Mir Kasim, uh, 
They said that we should become the Nawabs of Bengal. Finally, in 1765, Mughal Emperor appointed company as Diwan of Provinces. What do we mean? It is a very important thing. Diwan of the Provinces. Here it means that now the company had the rights to collect the revenue from the people. They had the right of collecting revenue. They finally allowed company to use vast revenue sources of Bengal. It solved a major problem that I had faced earlier. From trade early, no, it was, okay. Yeah, now the money they were earning from the, now, the power of collecting revenue from the people was now in the hands of the, who? EIC, that's my East India Company. Now, they usually came to India for the trading purpose because what they wanted was the money so that they could sell goods higher rate at Europe and uh, they could buy at cheaper prices in India. Now, because they earned too much of money, this could satisfy their needs, right? Okay. Now, company rule expands. Now, here comes my subsidiary alliances. Um, I think I have video for subsidiary alliances as well. I'll show you for the subsidiary alliance as well if I have. Yeah, I think I made a video for everything. Mm. Um, did I not make anything for that? Mm. But I think I have it with me. Well, no problem. Whenever I'll get no, I'll show you the video. Yeah, so no problem. Let me tell you about this thing. Uh, this thing that is what? Yeah, the subsidiary alliance. It was. Uh, it was a. Uh, now the there were basically, there were three policies, of, expansion. The policies of expansion by the British, the East India Company. We have three policies, basically three. Number one I have is what my subsidiary alliance. What do I have? My subsidiary alliance. All right. Number two I have is what my direct conquest. Direct conquest. All right. After this thing, I have the Doctrine of Lapse. So basically in this chapter, you know what, we'll be studying these three policies in detail. Subsidy Alliance. What's with Subsidy Alliance? Um, subsidy Alliance means that in India, <sighs> just a minute, give me a minute. In India, the rulers, they would not have any armed forces. It was said that the rulers won't have any armed forces. They were to be protected by the company. Company would protect the rulers. And in order for that, the rulers have to pay the company. Right. And now this payment was so high, you can't believe. And if, if any ruler failed to pay no what was happened was that his territory was taken away his territory his territory was annexed by the by company right a good idea of expansion right what brilliant way brains did they have they said that we will only protect you. We'll use your tools only, and we'll protect you. And in order, you will play. You will pay us. And if you will not pay us, no, we're gonna take your land away from you. I'm like, what? Isn't it 
crazy all right so anyways let's move on now we have some kingdoms like the avad a good example is the avad avad was annexed on the basis of the subsidiary alliance in 1858 i remember um i don't know remember the date but still yeah yeah 1801 avad was forced to give its half of its territory if you're not able to see let me underline avad was forced to give half of its territory to the company in 1801 as he failed to pay subsidiary forces hyderabad was also forced to see it territories on similar grounds right yes the tiger of the mysore it's a very very interesting topic um uh, let me uh what do i say that let me show you the video for that thing the tiger of mysore because yeah Tipu was called the tiger of Mysore. Once, Tipu Sultan went hunting in the forest with a French friend. He came face to face with a tiger. Oh, my gun is not working. Tipu's dagger fell down when the tiger pounced upon it. But he reached for the dagger, picked it up, and killed the tiger with it. From then, he adopted the tiger as his enemy. His throne was decorated with it. All the upholstery and cushions too had stripes. Even the soldiers wore jackets with tiger stripes. The East India Company intends to settle down in India and establish its hold. I vow that I will not let it happen. To check British advances, Tipu signed a treaty with the French. My aim is to strengthen my military power. Tipu established a huge ordnance factory at Devanagari. He also built a military manual called Futu Ul Mujahideen. Tipu was also very fond of innovations. He had a variety of swords, daggers, guns, and pistols. Tipu was also a good administrator. He built a chain of excellent roads and constructed tanks and dams to promote agriculture. He introduced new industries, promoted trade and commerce. I banned the production and distribution of liquor and other intoxicants in the state of Mysore. Rockets were manufactured and stored. The rocket men were trained to launch their rockets at an angle calculated from the diameter of the cylinder and the distance of the target. This scared the British. Tipo is growing powerful. He has got more powerful rockets than us. We need to stop him. With the help of the Nizam of Hyderabad and the Marathas, the British attacked Mysore. The battle lasted for three years. Finally, Tipu was defeated. You have to sign a treaty. Tipu was forced to sign. and had to concede half of his kingdom and pay an indemnity of 33 million rupees to the british and their allies lord cornwallis also took tipu's two sons as hostage despite these hardships tipu didn't give up it is better to live one day like a lion than a hundred years like a sheep i will not waste much time I will rebuild my army against the British. With a lot of hard work, he paid off his indemnity and got his sons back. He slowly regained his power as well. Tipu's brilliant spirit to fight against odds remains unmatched in history.
Due to this, he has been aptly nicknamed as the Tiger of Mysore. In the year 1799, there was a sudden attack on Mysore. Tipu was not prepared for the fierce attack. The British marched into Mysore and thus began the Fourth Mysore War. Tipu fought like a tiger. The enemy is too powerful. This war will not give us victory. Tipu was right. His fort was almost impenetrable. But the British armies broke through the defending walls and surrounded the palace. This fort will not hold out much longer. I should first save the women inside the palace. I will not allow women to suffer humiliation at the hands of the British. They would rather die by my sword. Before the enemies get to the ladies, I have to reach them. Tipu hurried towards the palace. At the huge gateways, there was intense fighting going on between Tipu's army and the British. Tipu was caught in. He was severely wounded. The wounded Tipu, still alive, grabbed his sword and attacked a soldier. The furious soldier drew out his gun and shot the Sultan. Tipu died a hero's death. All right. Okay, so this is Claire, right? The tiger of Mysore. So basically, once he met face to face with the tiger, right, and he, you know, managed the tiger. He actually, he tried to manage the tiger. He did not have a gun. He did not have a dagger. The dagger he had fell to the ground. Ground pay, his dagger fell. Now what happened? Tiger he was here face to face with the person. And his dagger fell. How the hell got he managed? He managed the tiger and picked up the sword and killed the tiger. That's why he's known as the tiger of my soul. And these EIC is very jealous of Tipu Sultan because number one, he modernized his army with French help. Let me write it below. Guys, if you want, you know, the links of these videos, I'll share them in the description box. Okay. Yeah, I'll share them so that even you can have access to these videos. All right. So, number one point was that he modernized his army with the French help. All right, and number two, he stopped exports of sandalwood, cinnamon, cardamom. All right, he stopped the export of these things. Number two, he he did not give the permission to the local rulers to trade with company. Okay. He stopped the exports. He at the Malabar coasts. Then, uh, you know, a kind of, then he modernized with the French help. So these were the basic reasons why Britishers were jealous of Tipu Sultan. Right. My saw had grown in strength under the leadership of powerful rulers like Haider Ali ruled and the famous Tipu Sultan. Right. From 1782 to 1799. My saw controlled profitable trade at Malabar coasts where the company purchased pepper carnival. In Arena 5, Tipu Sultan, it is uh, 1785.
Tipu Sultan stopped the export of sandalwood, pepper, cardamom through the ports of his kingdom, and this allowed local merchants for trading with the company. He also established a close relationship with the French and modernized with the French army. Right? I told you this thing only. Let's move on forward. Mm, I don't know what's wrong with this thing. Forward. Britishers were furious. They saw Heather and Tipu as ambitious, arrogant, and dangerous rulers who had to be controlled and crushed. Four wars were fought with my sword. The only last battle of Sirang and Patan did the company ultimately win a victory. Matlab basically. Just a minute, let me change the pen here. Yeah. Four wars occurred with the Marathas, three wars occurred. Here, four wars occurred. In the rest, three wars of these people, I mean, the Mysore wars, there was no victory, no victory. But at the last fourth war, the company won. Battle of the Sirangam Patnam, right? He was killed by defending his capital Sirangam Patnam. Mysore was placed under form of ruling dynasty of the Wodiars, and a subsidiary alliance was imposed on the state. Yep, now we have the war with the Marathas. Yep, I have video for this as well. Okay. War with the Marathas. Okay. Do I don't have? Yep, I have, but I don't know. I have not linked it. But no worries. I'll show you the video. Right. Mm. Uh, revolt of eighteen fifty seven. Doctrine of lapse. Anglo Maratha War. I have a simplified Anglo Maratha War. Mm. Okay, I don't know where it is. Yeah, I have, but I'm not able to find it. Mm. Basically, the Anglo Maratha War. Anglo Maratha War, right? Ab, abhi humne abhi tak we had talked about the war with. Bengal. Right now, we were talking about Bengal Ki War. Right now, we also had talked about the Mysore Wars. Bengal's War, Battle of Plasa and Mysore War. Number three, we get to talk about the Anglo Maratha War. There is a chain of these Maratha Wars that's known as the Anglo Maratha War. In total, Three wars were played. I mean, three wars had occurred between the Marathas and the EIC. First Anglo-Maratha war, there was no clear victory. It was 1775 to 82. British and Marathas supported the Jankand Rao. British supported this person, Marathas, all Marathas under leadership of Nanan Pandavas. Anyways, result... The Treaty of Salabai both agreed to help each other. Basically, what do we say that? There was no clear victory. No clear victory. In the second war, you know, in, it occurred from 18, um, 1803 to 1805. Two years. What happened was that areas called okay here it's not mentioned i'll write them okay areas that's your orissa orissa agra and delhi these regions were attacked these were captured okay orissa agra and delhi were captured in the second anglo maratha war the third anglo maratha war crushed the peshwas they all were killed. 
clear victory of the britishers right five maratha ji gives peshwa sindhya holkar gaikwad bhonsle right marathas were defeated later they became the subordinates of british on indian independence all right okay is this much clear the war with the marathas right three wars occurred which we say as the anglo maratha war all right let's come to the policy of the paramountancy <laughs> policy of paramountancy basically this policy told that britishers are superior and in this case we have a girl i mean sorry we have a lady rani chhannama yeah who protested but she was again you know what could the people do you know anyone who used to come in against with the british was either arrested was either killed you know these kinds of thing happened so it is clear from the it's clear from the above that early 19th century company has perpetuated an aggressive policy under lord hastings who was this thing introduced by lord hastings governor general from 1830 to 23 introduced a policy called the policy of the paramount nc was now initiated now the company claimed that its authority was paramount or superior supreme hence its power was greater than the indian states in order to protect its interest it was justified in annexing and threatening to annex any of the indian kingdom yeah this view continued to guide the later british policies as well this process however did not go unchallenged for example then the british tried to annex small states of kittur in karnataka today rani chandma to chandma i don't know what took arms to lead an anti british movement she was arrested in 1824 and died in prison in 1829 but rayana a poor chokidar of sangoli in kittur carried this resistance with popular support he destroyed the british camps and records he was caught and hanged by british in 1830 okay so you can see what was the policy of paramount in the they said that we are superior we are superior than whom than the indian states and we can occupy any place what kind of stupidity was that oh my god my favorite topic the doctor rain of laps let me show you the documentary on this thing oh my god strong with my system today here i got the doctrine of laps oops what happened open the doctrine of laps was an annexation policy purportedly devised by lord dalhousie who was the governor general for the east india company in india between 1848 and 1856 According to the doctrine any princely state or territory under the direct influence of the British East India Company as a vassal state under the British subsidiary system would automatically be annexed if the ruler was either manifestly incompetent or died without a male heir the latter supplanted the long established right of an Indian sovereign without an heir to choose a successor in addition the British decided whether potential rulers were competent competent enough the doctrine and its application were widely regarded by many indians as illegitimate history at the time of its adoption the british east india company had imperial administrative jurisdiction over wide regions of the subcontinent the company took over the princely states of satara jaipur and sambalpur nagpur and jhansi tanjore and arcot udaipur and oudh under the terms of the doctrine of laps mostly claiming that the ruler was not ruling no problem it's not good explanation anyways let me tell you what was the thing was that who is this lady anyone 
द रानी लक्ष्मी वाई फ्रॉम झांसी यू नो वर्ट डॉक्ट्रीन ऑफ लैब्स मैंट दैट इन ए किंगडम इफ ए किंग डिड नॉट हैव इट्स ओन नेचुरल है मेल है मीन्स इफ दे डिड नॉट हैव देयर ओन सन then their kingdom would be annexed would be annexed all right um basically doctrine of lapse was introduced by lord dalhousie now he said that in a in a kingdom if they did not have their own son then this kingdom would be for the i mean like it would be annexed by the company right and this was this, this wasn't fair right was it it wasn't fair so in many areas so we have the nana sahib why did nana sahib react nana sahib he was an adopted son of the peshwa bajira i mean the peshwa the peshwa he was adopted son and he said that i want to be the king who are you to say that i can't be a king right on the other hand we have the rani lakshmi bai where was this nana sai from kanpur please remember rani lakshmi bai was from where mm, yeah we all know she was from jhansi right she said that i have my own son i mean sorry i have a, an adopted son and please let him be the king please let him be the king but britishers you know the visu rude doctrine of lapse final wave of annexions occurred in lord delhouse he was a governor general from this time period he devised a policy that came to be known as doctrine of lapse doctrine of lapse declared that if an indian ruler died without a male heir his kingdom his kingdom would lapse that is would become part of company's territory one kingdom after was by applying doctrine of satara sambhalpur udaipur the nagpur and jhansi Finally, in eighteen fifty six, company also took over Avadh. This time was okay. Yeah, Avadh, Avadh, Avadh. Basically, you know what Avadh was annexed for subsidiary alliance. Yeah, some portions of Avadh were for subsidiary, and some portions were for doctrine of lapse. Oh my God! How hard, jewelers. introduction of codes by warren hastings okay this topic isn't in your books but it is in your course so i'm explaining you yes warren hastings was one of the many important figures who played a significant role in expansion of the company's power by his time in company he had acquired power not only in bengal but also in bombay and madras british territories were broadly divided into administrative units called presidencies these were th- so basically the powers of the british okay we had three british territories okay british ki jo territories thi the british territories there were three we had the madras provinces we had the calcutta the bombay presidencies so these were the three territories of the britishers clear now from this time period 1772 a system of justice was established each district has had two courts criminal courts that's the fauddari adalat or and a civil court criminal court for crimes civil courts for 
डाइवोसिस एंड समथिंग रिलेटेड टू लॉज द दीवानी अदालत ओके मॉलविस एंड द हिंदू पंडित्स इंटरप्रेटेड इंडियन लॉज फॉर यूरोपियन डिस्ट्रिक्ट कलेक्टेड हुज प्रेसिडेंट ओवर सिविल कोर्ट्स क्रिमिनल कोर्ट्स वर स्टिल अंडर काजी एंड मुफ्ती हु आर दीज पीपल काजी द यू नो द जज and under supervision of the collectors right what was the problem it was a brahman pandit gave a different interpretation of local laws based right they were two different changes in composition of companies army very important they were basically uh, these changes number one cavalry requirements of the company declined what do i mean by cavalry means the requirements of the horses declined unko ab kam ghode chahiye the Peasants were recruited army, and they were trained as sepoys, and the no, and no, not the sepoy army. They had to keep pace with changing military requirements. Company decided to develop its uniformly like other armies, right? It's as a warfare technology change from this. Cavalry requirements declined. This is because British were fighting in Burma. Afghanistan is up for arms and ma- muskets and matchlocks. this musket and the matchlocks these were you know what matchlock or muskets these two were guns to be based with okay now okay yay we completed with this chapter yep it was a very lengthy chapter but yes we are done with this chapter and congratulations to you Thank you for watching this video. I hope you guys have understood this topic very clearly. If you guys have any doubt, please I say you yeah, I've blocked the comment section due to some reasons. Yeah, I will conduct some live classes. I try to solve all your doubts if you have any because I clear because you know I I teach the topics very you know. in a very simplified manner for you guys i work really very hard i create slides of 26 pages i mean i create presentation of 26 slides please i work super hard for you if you like my video if you watch my video i'm a new youtuber please like share and subscribe to my channel for more such videos okay thank you and i Got to see you in my next videos. All right, I'll I'll share the link for this these all videos in my description. Bye.